So, thank you, Karen. So this is the meeting of the Board of Water Commissioners on Tuesday, uh, May 17th. And um, we're going to start this meeting with a discussion on the, uh, the bid for um, from Digit regarding the additional improvements that are required for the Coles Neck well field. Um, so that's why I see Tyler is with us here from Environmental Partners. So I uh, would like to um, ask him to kind of walk us through the bid, uh, the, the, uh, the bid that was submitted by Digit for the, uh, the work. Yeah, sure, no problem. How are you doing, everybody? Uh, Jim, can you hear me? Yes. All right, great. Um, so, yes, yeah, so um, as we all know on the call, um, the Coles Neck Well Field, or sorry, for the Coles Neck Water Main Project, uh, we received favorable bids uh, late last year from Digit Construction, um, which enabled us to uh, look into potential additional work in the Coles Neck well field that had to be done that wasn't under that contract originally. Um, so EP put together a price proposal for Digit to quote for this additional work. Um, and we broke that down into three phases of work. Uh, phase one would be yard piping and existing condition assessment of the wells themselves. Um, so that would be installing new six inch ductile iron pipe uh, primarily between well 3R and the building, the uh, Coles Neck well field pump house. Um, some appurtenances like gate valves, hydrants, um, there'll be, there is a, um, a line item there for rock excavation and disposal and unsuitable materials as per most water main projects. Um, and then we also had an item for- Tyler, Tyler can I stop yep. you for a moment? Uh, can you tell us the, where the what's the location of Well 3R relative sure. to the pump house? Yes. So Well 3R is um, I could actually can I share my screen? Um, what I'll do is I'll share my screen of the map that we had sent to dig it. That will help me. Um, uh, host is disabled screen sharing. I don't know if uh... I just I just let you in. Go ahead. You're all set. All right. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yes. So this area right over here where my cursor is is the existing um, pump house. And so anything off on this side is part of the water main construction project, which is not shown in this plan. Um, well 3R is over here on this end. It's down this uh, gravel access road from the pump house to well 3R. Um, well 2 is right next to the pump house and well 1 is actually inside the pump house. So those are the three wells that are, exist at the Coles Neck well field right now. And so the work for phase one would include installing new water main from well 3R down to the pump house. And then there's a little inset plan right here showing the pump house, but we're going to actually connect to well two and then run into the building. Okay. Thank you. Yep, no problem. And then in addition to that, what, that work, we also call for rehabilitating well 3R, which is a cleaning of the well, uh, pulling the pump and servicing the well um, to make sure that, that well, which is fairly new um, in terms of wells, it's, it was 2011, I believe it was installed. Um, so we'll be able to get a better idea of its capacity um, after that cleaning. Tyler, um, I'm sorry, can you just kind of give the rationale? I mean, 3R is already connected to the pump house, correct? Yes, 3R is connected to the pump house with uh, four inch piping. So this would connect it with six inch piping, which would, re which would reduce an hydraulic restrictions the four inch piping could create. Also, it will enable um, six inch piping in the yard for future well development in the area if ever investigated. With um, with a, what's the flow rate with the four inch versus the six inch? 
Uh, right now, the wells, um, and you'll have to ask Whitewater specifically about what the capacity of the wells are currently. I understand that um, the well field hasn't been used to its fullest extent the last couple of years. Um, right now, the wells are not pumped uh, at high levels, um, but the specific capacity of well 3R um, is, I believe, up to 300 gallons per minute. <laughs> and that's 300 gallons a minute at four inch? Uh, yeah, so that, that's the specific capacity of the well. So if you want to pump that through a four inch, you'd be, it'd be kind of restrictive to get 300 gallons a minute through a four inch pipe. There'd be significant head losses there. Yeah, I'm just trying to understand the difference between the flow rate from four inch to six inch given the well's capacity. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can pull some numbers together for you specifically. I know that I did, I did an hydraulic analysis uh, a little while ago. I don't have that in front of me right now. I don't want to give you the wrong numbers, but generally speaking, a four inch pipe, uh, once you get over like 200 jet gallons a minute, you start hitting significant head losses. So the amount of uh, head you lose trying to push the water through the pipe uh, becomes fairly significant and it taxes the pump. Yeah, but, but if it was a six inch line, how much is the cost penalty and how great is the uh, flow benefit? Uh, so the cost penalty, it's simply, it, it's really just operational costs in terms of head. Uh, you could translate head into power into uh, electricity consumption. Right, so the bigger the pump, bigger the pipe, should be less restriction. Yes. Now, if we had a six inch pipe in there with an existing pump, we could we could maintain pressure on a six inch line, correct? Yes. Very so much so. So why not put the six inch line where we're working on it? We're putting the six inch line in. Oh, okay. So we're we're specifying we're gonna upsize the existing four inch to a six inch. Well. Oh, I misunderstood. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, Tyler, I'm just trying to understand what the benefit is of going from four to six, because, you know, in terms of, in terms of flow rate or capacity, um, it's, we have an enormous amount of capacity on the system, and I'm just trying to understand the, the rationale for investing the capital now to do this six inch upgrade, um, especially when the it sounded like almost like the first thing you want to do is clean the well to find out what the actual capacity is of the four inch because there's some question about that and the other ancillary sort of question i guess or the thing that's in the back of my mind is um we haven't needed this well so this is a redundant this is additional capacity over and above and beyond um the redundant capacity of the boy scout camp um we still have well two at this location so in effect we've got you know, four sort of major working wells. Is that right? Yeah. So, yeah. So, well, two, what I understand with the conversation with the Whitewater is well, two um, has is in suspicion of being collapsed. Um, we believe that the uh, Whitewater suspects that the pump for well, two is pumping sand, which would indicate a catastrophic failure of well, two. So, essentially, what we're trying to do with this additional work is to bring the Coles Neck well field up to the capacity of the Boy Scout camp well field so that way the town has a true redundant source. Right, I understand that part. The, the issue though is, is that we've got so much capacity on the system now. The question in my mind is how, why do we need additional capacity? Because the Boy Scout camp right now, I think has five times um, peak uh, capacity already. Um, with a redundant well at the same capacity. So you get, um, I think when we started producing calculations last time on, you know, the number of days that we can run without having to run a, run a pump or run a well is it's about, you know, three to five days of peak, of peak requirements. So I'm just trying to, you know, the, the rationale to just make it the same as the Boy Scout camp doesn't make a lot of sense to me if, we, if we're adding you know, just a huge amount of additional capacity that we really don't need. So it's, it's always ideal to have redundant sources because the Boy Scout camp well, although there's two pumps there, um, if there was ever an issue at the well field itself, uh, a, contaminant, a contaminant 
um, an emergency spill, anything with a with a source itself had to be shut off for a long period of time. Um, the town would need a redundant source, and having a redundant source that's already available is a, um, is one of those ideal moments. So it's always good for a redundant source water. Um, you also have the ability to um, pump different rates in terms of the Water Management Act requirements. So DEP always recommends redundant sources. Um, well Fleet has always had them. They've always had the Boy Scout Camp Wellfield and uh, the Coles Neck Wellfield. So the redundant sources are on paper have always been the been there. However, we realized that the Coles Neck Wellfield has, has kind of fallen into a state of uh, disrepair a little bit. And that's what we realized with this water main project that we want to kind of get it back up to, to where it should be to be a true redundant source to the um, Boy Scout Camp Wellfield. I guess I kind of keep asking the same question, but is if the Boy Scout camp already has five to 10 times excess capacity and uh, you know, well 3R at four inch has maybe two or three times excess capacity for our peak requirements, um, I'm not sure why we want to spend so much, so much money going from four inch to six inch. It's so just simply cleaning the well and getting it on, online and getting it dispatched properly um, gets us up and running, um, making sure the gen backup generators are working, you know, a variety of the other operational concerns and issues that we're trying to address there um, before going ahead and, you know, trenching, being a new trench and putting in a, a, a six inch line. Maybe it should be an eight inch line. Maybe it should, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm just kind of not understanding the rationale behind going from four to six um, and why not, you know, potentially eight or something else. Um, it seems like the main issue is to just is to get that get that well operational at you know as it sits and make sure we've got backup generator generator in case of you know an electrical outage. Yeah, so th there is additional work beyond just for upsizing the pipe that we are with, that we asked to get to quote so is so I can break down the cost with just the water main upsizing price for the six inch. Uh, essentially, it's uh, it's a fair price considering that's what Digit does, and um, they're very efficient at putting in water main. So essentially, they're already mobilized on site. Uh, we figured, as for the price, it's the upsides does reduce the hydraulic restriction. It will not tax the pump as much. Um, the pipe within the well, the well station itself, next down to two inch PVC, which is a significant hydraulic restriction. You can't even get two hundred GPM through a two inch PVC pipe so that there's additional upsize of pipe there um, as well that we'll talk about. But so essentially we're proposing a variety of improvements that include SCADA, well work, rehabilitation work um, as part of this pricing request. We, we, attempt, we, we essentially attempted to get as much work as possible within this contract um, for take it to quote for the town to consider. Um, not everything needs to be accepted by the town. Um, we just wanted to put true bid numbers to this for consideration. Does that make sense? Tom, it looks like you're uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I was on I was on mute. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, it makes sense. I'm just trying to I'm just trying to get a clear rationale for each each investment. I mean, certain, yep. certainly a number of these investments, you know, are categorical yep. that we need to make them. Um, and just trying to wrap my head around, you know, digging a trench and putting it in a new pipe is probably one of the more costly components of that particular uh, part of the project. Uh, it is a it does have a cost associated with it. So the six inch pipe cost um, is. They quoted $95 per linear foot, which brings out a total cost of $48,925 for that item. Um, so that the phase one work, as I explained, is the yard piping and existing conditions assessment. Phase two work, um, which is contingent on the uh, existing condition of the wells, uh, involves mobilization and demobilization of a of a new well drain rig, 
rig to drill a new 12 inch replacement well tube. Uh, we suspect that, as I mentioned before, well tube could be collapsed to the screen, that there could be a catastrophic failure of well tube. So the cost is to basically drill a new 150 foot uh, deep 12 inch replacement well for well two. Um, which is a sizable cost, but it would only need to be conducted after a CCTV camera inspection of the existing well two to, to confirm that the well, in fact, is non salvageable. Um, it also includes a new submersible pump and motor for well two, uh, six inch check valve, wire, and pipe, and then a pitless adapter. That is the phase two work. The phase three work includes work in the Coles Neck well house specifically. Uh, the demolition of the existing two inch process piping, um, the demolition of concrete around the floor for the two inch piping so they can bring in new uh, new PVC pipe, uh, new gate valves, check valves, flow meter, ball meter, uh, surge relief valve, chemical injection, closed pipe supports, um, skidding controls. And we did include a cost for a new 50 kW generator as well. So all in in terms of the pricing request um, for the town to consider, uh, Diggett's total price comes in at $446,625.30. Uh, um, Neil, you had a question on one of the items, I believe, correct? Yes, uh, Tyler, uh, I, I'm in the well business and uh, the... Um, the pitless adapters uh, that are, uh, the pitless adapters that is mentioned, uh, your sourcing is uh, very expensive. I buy them all the time, and they're in the hundreds of dollars, not thousands of dollars. Yeah, so this is uh, Digit Construction's quote for the number. Um, and please note that it's not a furnished price, it's a furnished install price. And this is a, a public bid project, so it's a prevailing rate project. So um, their cost is, is essentially what they what they quote. So I mean, we could go out and we could rebid this as a, in terms of a public bid as its own project, uh, and get three or four bidders to to compete on this. Um, but I do I do believe that the pitless adapter on six thousand dollars is what they bid is um, pretty close to what I typically see for pitless adapter um, furnish and install. Well, I, I, I've, uh, uh, I buy them all the time and uh, uh, they're not 6,000 e even installed. It's just a hole through a casing and uh, uh, the brass or stainless uh, uh, pitless adapters. And yeah. the, most, they, the most expensive are some, some few hundred dollars. But exactly. when I saw the price of sixty five hundred, uh, I I need to uh, change uh, um, my uh, uh, my business. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it public bid work with prevailing wage projects, um, they're getting paid union rates. Um, essentially, we don't let them bill for the hour; they bill per item, so they have to factor in a lot of costs associated with items that they they work. So. Um, particularly in the phase two work, which this is a part of, most of the cost here is actually from their well driller, not from Digit themselves, but Digit would be installing the pitless adapter. So they'll have their own crew mobilized. They'll, they'll dig down to the this, uh, five feet below right of the casing, and then they'll cut out the pitless location and install it and, and weld it in place. So we had estimated for that item in, in our previous, um, Middle to the town, we estimated to be about sixty five hundred bucks. Digit's quote came in at six thousand dollars, which is similar to what we've seen in the past. So it's the item itself to furnish it is probably around, like you said, three hundred to four hundred dollars. Um, but there are costs associated with getting the crew out there, doing the work, and then all of the work associated with it. But that's um, part of the mobilization, isn't it? It is, yeah. So their mobilization number, they put in uh, $10,000, but they actually have two crews to mobilize. They have the well drillers crew for their, their the well and the pump test and everything, and they also have Diggett's crew. So they, they they split their number out each way. I mean, some items they penny, some items they put more at. Um, 
it's just how generally speaking public contractors bid projects is they they move money around from one item to another so can, can i ask tyler um when you, environmental partners did essentially did an analysis of this bid correct we did yeah so when we this is actually the second iteration of the uh the bid that we received the first iteration um a lot of the phase two costs were in in my in our opinion um unreasonable so we went back and we negotiated with dig on a lot of the phase two prices and stuff they had a uh, 15 percent markup that they were putting on the driller for their work that we thought was was relatively high in this environment so we work with them we work with the drip with their uh we work with them and have them go back to their driller about making some changes to their to their bid, and ultimately we negotiated down the phase two work by about forty two thousand dollars. Okay. Are there any other questions on this? Tom, are you getting ready to say something? No, I was ready to throw in my hat. <laughs> okay. So um, um, the other thing I want to mention is, is that the total price for this is, is a little high compared to what the project of the allowable um, procurement project will allow like in, in Massachusetts procurement. Um, Projects are allowed to have a, a change order value up to 25% of the total contract. Um, so at being at 446,000, we are really close to that number. Um, the 25% change order value is, is at, for the project itself is $477,911. So we already accepted one change order for winter pavement at the beginning of the job of $24,000. Um, and then we also have a price adjustments uh, change order under consideration because of uh, Massachusetts bid law requires price adjustments for diesel and asphalt um, with the essentially the escalation of those commodities in the last six months has been extreme and triggered the price adjustments law of about $12,000. So essentially, Long story short, we are actually at the limit of what we can accept for this job. If we if we accepted every item, um, we'd be very close to that 25% limit. So EP recommends uh, actually taking the generator out of this item, out of this bid from to get scope entirely and seeing if the town will be willing to request either a new contract for a generator replacement or uh, seeing if Whitewater's contract, they can procure the generator and install it on behalf of the town and have that collected as a maintenance contract. Um, it's the one item within this list of improvements that can be kind of isolated from the rest of them. It's not going to impact, taking the generator out is not going to impact the rest of the improvements that DIG is going to do. Uh, a lot of the other improvements are kind of subject to other uh, pay items. Well, the, um, on the issue of the generator, does that include the transfer switch? That does not include the transfer switch. It includes, uh, it is essentially a remove and replace of the existing generator. So it is essentially uh, a disconnect and reconnect. Um, is, the gener is the transfer switch known to be broken? I don't know. Uh, that's something that would have to be evaluated. Yes, I would. I prefer the idea of taking the generator out of it because we're a long way from figuring out what the hell is happening there. Yeah, I think that it would be definitely um, advisable to do an electrical assessment of the gener of the pump station to see if a transfer switch, perhaps other equipment needs to be upgraded um, or replaced. Okay. So the generator yeah. itself, that item is $61,000 specifically. So taking that out and bring us to a more appropriate level in terms of the, in terms of this contract. 
um, and we'd stay hopefully under that 25% change order cap. Okay. Uh, Jim? Yes, go ahead. Uh, you know, I, I guess one of the things that I find very confusing is, isn't our idea that here, the big picture that we want to be sure that this system that we have is capable of expanding because we really want to look to the future with the idea of getting many more people to join up. Is that sort of the, the background of all of this? I think that's included in this because we, as we know, we have um, 95 Lawrence, uh, the affordable housing project will be uh, we're hopefully will be on the water system within the next few years. And we're also looking at other properties that uh, potentially would add significant number of uh, units as well. So this is just putting us in a situation where we could greatly expand with when all of this was done. Yeah, well, just as a reminder about the, the, the current system, uh, in the winter months, we're absolutely fine in terms of the amount of water that we are able that, to, that we pump and that we, use, that we fill the tank with. Um, that the average usage uh, right now is around 35,000 gallons a day. But as we know, in the middle of summer, that can go up to the uh, mid 80,000s, up to close to 90,000. And so that, I mean, we're, and once we have these additional properties on there, it, it could very well exceed the 100,000 100, gallons per day that would then trigger us being um, moving into a different category with respect to the water system, the way uh, DEP evaluates it. So yes, indeed, there is a potential for expansion and the likelihood that it won't be that far off before we will be needing additional capacity um, or, that, or at least adequate capacity to deal with the summer surge. Okay. But if you kind of, um, but if we do the math, I don't know what DEP would say in terms of what they want for redundancy, but each of the Boy Scout camp wells right now is about 300,000 gallons a day also. So in the peak summer months, even if we're at 100,000 gallons withdrawal per day, each well is only coming on once every three days to fill the tower. And it comes on for a relatively short period of time. So we've got we've got an enormous amount of excess capacity. And that's, that's why I keep going back to this four inch versus six inch on well two. Um, you know, it, even if even if the Boy Scout camp is gone, if we've got 300,000 gallons a day um, on well 3R, excuse me, um, it pulls that. That, that would still only run you know, once every two or three days at peak, at our worst case scenario on the peak of the summertime. Um, you know, and there's 50,000 associated with going from four inch to six inch. Um, I mean, I, we may need to do that. I just, I just question whether we need to do it now. Um, and, uh, you know, what the long term plan is, you know, back to what Catherine was saying. You know, I'd feel better if I knew that six inches was the right number and not eight inch, um, you know, for future capacity requirements. And or after the investigation on well two to see if it's built it in or not or whatnot, you know, if what what we're looking at for you know additional well capacity in another well at the uh, Coles Neck location. I just don't my I'm just not I'm just not comfortable with where we are for a long range plan. I, I, I think we clearly need to get we are up and running. I think we need to clean it. I think we need to do skater modifications. Um, it sounds like the, you know, the concrete work, the demo work um, to get that two inch line that's running within the pump station uh, increased in size to match, you know, or at least get better, get a better throughput on that. That makes sense. And it's above ground and relatively easy to do a simple concrete demo. I mean, there's some stuff that we absolutely have to do. And I guess I'm just trying to understand what we have to do versus what would be nice to do. And, and in the 
you know, what would be nice to do category, um, where those nice to do things get us in terms of the overall system performance. Yes. Another thing I would add to that is it's always good to evaluate a system, not in terms of domestic capacity, but in terms of fire flow capacity. Um, fire flow demand is often uh, not expected. You never know when you're going to have a fire uh, event, but it will use significantly more water um, in those events and can drain the tank relatively quickly. So having redundant capacities, um, source water that can fill that tank as soon as possible um, are in, in essence lifesavers. Yeah, the chief came to us the other week, you know, on our two meetings ago, I think, and said he's the worst, the worst fire he's ever seen was about 20,000 gallons. For the whole job or for just per hour? That was for the, that was for the whole job. He said, you know, it's about 20,000 gallons for the fire. I think it was the one on Main Street that burned down the former post office. Um, and, you know, so he, when he went through the numbers in terms of fire needs, it wasn't that significant in terms of our, you know, in terms of any of our wells at 300,000 gallons. Um, so it, that didn't seem to cause too much of a concern. The thing I'm concerned about with the sizing of the downstream uh, uh, pipe size after the pump is that are we ever going to get to the thing where we're going into cavitation? Because that'll just eat pumps like crazy. We have enough trouble with that. Yeah, we do not anticipate that the well 3R pump will, will cavitate um, at a six inch pipe. Will you please explain what that means? What will happen is if the pump can't get move enough move enough water through the downstream pipe, it's still going to run like it was going fast. And what happens is you get air gaps that comes out of the water because you can't suck enough. And then that'll erode the pumps. So under this model that we're talking about now with a six inch uh, line from 3R to the pump house, is there any potential for that happening, Tyler? Or a cavitation? Right. We did not anticipate cavitation would, would take place on the six inch line, or for, because of the six inch line for the well three outcome. pump. Tyler, do you uh, happen to know the drop pipe size uh, on three R? The current drop pipe size is probably a four inch. It's connecting the pitless adapter to the pump. I, I believe it's a four inch. I, I I was not involved with the product that installed it, and the record is not one hundred percent. We'll definitely identify it um, as part of the uh, rehabilitation. So, I um, think that there is there are sufficient questions that we are not in a position to make a decision today on this. And I would also like to ask um, uh, Rebecca Ruffley to uh, advise us with respect to the, the financial implications here for the um, contract with Mass Works if we are uh, within, with, assuming these changes or modifications in the bid, if we would still be within the, um, the limits as established by uh, the initial co uh, contract. Jim, I was actually just trying to read about that. I was sifting through my papers, so I'm already on that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. So are, are we okay to move on then? Tyler, can I just ask one quick question? Sure. Tyler, did, um, you bid this under 30 and 39M? That's correct. Okay. All right. There's just one other thing I wanted to look up. So I just want to make sure I did the right. Thank you. 
Okay. Any other questions? Not hearing you, Tom. You're you're muted. No. Uh, when you say move on, are you ready to vote or to table? To table it. Agreed. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, I'd like to move next then to the other item that's on our agenda, and that has to do with the continuation of our discussion on connection fees um, and the rate structure. And I'd like to point out that this is likely we'll we're, we're going to probably need to go, um, not today, but in the next meeting, we'll be calling going into executive session. Maybe some of it will involve um, or that we not discuss individual properties in, in open session. Okay. And that, by the way, that would include um, the um, property, the North 95 Lawrence Road property, since that is under, will be under development by POA. Um, we don't know the conditions yet about their, their plans for the water hookup there. So uh, that will still need to be discussed. So, Kurt, do you want to pick up on where we kind of left off on the um, discussion around the, say, connection fees? Well, um, yeah, I think we we had some questions about the about um, how many people we had in payment plans, um, you know, for, relative to the uh, former connection fee, and. Uh, Karen had provided us a list of all the folks that have, you know, have paid under the old program, who is actually still in a payment plan, um, who might be in arrears in a payment plan and that sort of thing. Um, and I, I, you know, I think we, that's the sort of stuff that we should probably hold off and discuss in executive session because those are individual property owners and uh, each one of those is an individual, um, you know, situation um, that I think we need to look at. Um, so I'm not sure beyond, um, you know, in terms of the, the connection fee, um, I think that's probably our executive session discussion. Um, we did have some, a couple of other points from our last meeting that we were going to follow up on this meeting, one having to do with um, um, the adoption of the unit method and if that works the way we, we intended it to work. Um, the other one was to look at uh, the potential for a commercial rate and um, I had agreed to look at a number of a number of our um, you know customers and look at their their current bills and what their bills would look like under the proposed rate structure, um, you know, being sensitive to what kind of an increase they'd see. Um, and actually, the bottom line on the on, on looking at a commercial rate is I don't I don't think it's necessary any longer. Um, the impact to um, several of the restaurants that I looked at was that their bills would be going up by about, you know, 10, 12 percent. Um, the increases were relatively modest for those customers, um, especially compared to some some other customers. So I actually my concerns were not borne out when I actually did the math. Um, they really are not um, significantly negatively impacted, even though the, you know, the block was changed from uh, a limit of um, uh, 85,000 to 60,000 for the um, for the for the go for the rate going from 942 to 1440 so that's a really big change in the in the, uh, the 942 is starting at 20,000 gallons it used to start at 35,000 gallons um, and go to 60,000 so the concern about those two blocks being increased quite dramatically for some of those larger users 
actually turned out not to be that much of a percentage increase in the overall bill. Um, so, you know, just at least for the board's, you know, benefit, I just, you know, the, the overall increases were like in the, you know, 10 to 15% range. Um, the overall rate structure, um, I think for, for an average customer, you know, it's going from um, 152 a year to 300, 305.20. Um, which is actually a, a bigger increase percentage. I'm sorry, wise. can you say that again? For the average customer using um, using forty thousand. Um, oh no, that's not right. The average customer using forty thousand gallons a year, their bill is going to be three hundred and five dollars and twenty cents. That's the average customer, and I think their their increase is closer to thirty percent um, as as a percentage. Overall I increase. It, I thought it was fairly close to the current, um, what their current bills were. Yeah, I mean the big change is the the um, customer service charge going from one sixty two to two fifty. That that by itself is is uh, a fifty four percent increase. In in the cost in the uh, base service fee, you're saying? Yeah, just in the base service fee. Right. The rate didn't change for the for the twenty thousand gallons, oh, so yeah. the rate really didn't change for the commodity fee. So net net, I think it's closer. You know, it's in the 30 30 ish range. So anyway, these large customers, even though it, it is a you know significantly higher. Um, price and they encounter that higher price sooner because the blocks changed. Overall, again, we're looking at 10, 10, 12, one customer is at 25. Um, so these percentages were in line with what other customers are seeing for an increase. So they were not out of line. They were not, you know, unusual. Okay. So anyway, I guess with that, I'm I'm fine with not using it, not doing. It. I think the rates are okay. I think we, you know, what we had considered before is probably fine, and um, at least for the time being, we don't really have a need or pressing need to try to do a commercial rate. Okay. Uh, so, I, uh, is there anything else that we need to discuss that does not have to go, in, that we don't have to go into executive session for? Well, I had brought up the issue where someone raised about starting to sell water. Okay. And I uh, have a lot of concern about that, what's involved, how you would do it in a sanitary way. Yeah, I don't know if that's that's a, We didn't put that on the agenda, so I'm not sure that we can no, I just wanted to mention it quickly to say what my concern was. That's all. Okay. Jeffrey, I, I looked at that and I don't think it's worth it doing right now by any means. We have so much more on our plate and the details become very complicated with a lot of outside people involved. So yeah. I think Exactly. Can, uh, but can we table that discussion until the yes. next meeting? Yeah. So, and or we'll put it on as a separate agenda item. Yeah, as well as there's yeah. um, one other item, another agenda item that we want to put on for that meeting, and that is um, rainwater harvesting. That there are, um, <laughs> yeah, I know, but, but there are additional issues coming up about that. Here in town, we already have a couple of properties in town that are uh, that are using rainwater test harvesting technology to increase their water supply. And I know that there's another property that is currently in the process of um, installing a system. So I'd like to um, have a further discussion about that at, at our next meeting. Okay. 
Yeah, that sounds good, Jim. I mean, both of those items are not on our agenda for this meeting. Right, right. No. Uh -uh. So we, we, can, we can talk about that. Um, Jim? Is there any uh, other? Jim? Yes. You have a question? Judah Hearn would like to ask a question. Okay. Jude, go, go ahead. ahead. Jude. You're muted, Hi, Jim. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Um, so at the select board meeting last week, I just want to be clear about like the average that people pay. Um, is the 250 per year, like whether you're a business or a house, it's 125 every six months, I think it said in the minutes. So that's like a base charge of 250. Is uh, that correct? That, right, that we have not um, finalized, I think, in, in terms of the base service fee for commercial properties as to whether or not that would be different. Um, oh, okay. But right now, everybody pays the 250 a year, it's or that's one, a proposal. It will be the, the currently it is um, 162. Yes, 162 for a residential property. Right. Okay. Um, and then, as you said, the rates for 40,000 gallons is like 325. So <laughs> they're paying theoretically like $700 or something a year for water. No, the, the, the 325 is the assumption right now of the 160 uh, is the um, base service fee, roughly 160 or 165, that range. And then the, the water cost would bring it up to about a total of about 300 and uh, between 300 and 350 dollars a year, depending upon what, yes, if they exceed the 40,000 gallons or not. Okay. Yeah. What I what I did, Jude, was um, just to clarify. I, um, we calculated it based on a total of 40,000 gallons per year is sort of the average user. Um, so that's 20,000 every six months. Um, so that particular customer, a 40,000 gallon per year customer, would pay 305.20 per year total, service fee plus water charges. Okay, um, that is so cheap. <laughs> I, said. I mean, that is like. I said how much I pay. I pay, I will be paying 1200 a year for one person. You know, maybe I get to 40,000. And I guess um, my other question is just, you know, about executive session. Okay, I understand, I guess. Um, but will the public know, you know, how many people and businesses are on the system? Is that information that you can share? so that we get a sense of, you know, that. And then also, has there ever been any talk about, as you talk about this summer surge, you know, which properties are on the water and rent them out? You know, why should I be paying 1200 a, a year for my water and subsidize this water system to people who are renting it out? And, are, and is any of that revenue possibly applicable to your, you know, your bond or, you know, some of your costs because you're not bringing in enough revenue. And I know at one point you had a tipping point. I think I read somewhere like 500 properties. Like, what are you hoping will be that coming up? Yeah, so just, um, uh, there were a couple of questions there, Jude, but at least one I can answer right off the bat, right off the top. Um, the new rate structure at a base service fee of um, $250 versus the 162 is kind of a dramatic change. Um, and the people who benefit from that are local residents because they're going to end up using more water typically. Um, so, you know, if your base service fee is $250 and you don't use that much water, um, you know, you're paying a significant percentage of your bill just in the base service fee. So we, we kind of think that that's going to um, primarily affect, um, you know, summer residents, the people that you're kind of, that you kind of alluded to before. We cannot, as a matter of law, differentiate um, customer classes um, except by cost of service. 
So we can't, you know, go try to figure out a rate that would apply to one group of customers differentially to another. Um, so in this case, all customers are paying the 250 annually um, and kind of based on what we're looking at, um, you know, we can kind of guess who may or may not um, benefit from that, but we kind of hope that, you know, year round residents are gonna will benefit from, from that change. And at the same time, we're overall gonna be collecting about another $50,000 which is to, you know, end putting the system on a pathway to reduce the amount of funding that is coming from the general fund. Um, we're not gonna get there right away. Um, we just can't, it would be draconian to increase the water rates um, to where that would be the case. Um, but we, we, we're very sensitive to um, trying to do, put our best efforts forward um, to move in that direction. Where's the 50,000 coming from? Our, our water consultant had calculated that um, based on his proposed rates um, versus the prior rates and how much um, additional money would need to come from the general fund based on the new rates um, versus the old rates. And then with you know changes in the customer uh, and the connection fees, our hope is to start to dramatically increase the number of customers on the system, which is, which is the real ultimate goal in terms of trying to reduce the amount of money coming from the general fund. So for the same amount of customers, just with the rate changes, you'd get an additional 50,000. And then as you say, reducing the connectivity from 6,000, as you said, to 750 will encourage more people, more revenue coming in to pay for itself. Yes, that's the direction we wanna be going. Yeah. As a clarification, when we're talking rates, that also includes the base service fee, which is the, um, that is kind of like the, uh, the portion of the fee, as you can see, it's larger than the actual water, so water usage rates. It, that, that, is, that kind of smooths out the, um, the revenues over the year because it's, it's a constant for any property that's, any residential property that's connected to the system. And, and increasing it from where it is now up to $125 twice a year will, assist, will helps in terms of moving us that, toward that $50,000 extra a year. Okay. And how many people are on this, how many properties are on the system now? Um, I, Karen, I don't have, I'm not sure the exact number, but it's in the, um, I don't know the last. 290, 295 roughly. And Karen, is that 295 those that are already connected or connected? Yes. And in connection. No. no, those are all already the ones that are connected. The ones that have the ability to connect in the future is like 50. They have paid the connection, they are paying the connection fee, and there's 50 of those. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So any, any more questions on this? Rebecca? Hi. Um, I just wanted to know if these are, this Excel sheet that you did, Kurt, if these are the same numbers as with the water consultant gave us because the last document that I have from the water consultant from March, um, my calculations were different than yours. So I just, and I haven't been here for two weeks, so maybe I missed another document, but I was just curious um, where you got the 304 from. I know it's 40,000 gallons, but what rate you were multiplying that by? Um, it's the... It comes from um, the, the numbers that he generated. It's one, one four, 140 per um, thousand for the first 20,000 per half year. Okay. So for a full year, it'd be 40,000. But if you, if you actually take those rates of 140 for the first 20, 942, it doesn't, it doesn't apply the upper rates, the 942 and the 1440 don't apply to somebody only using 40,000. They're only in the first block. Right. 
So mine says 138. So I must not have the right. I have the, the document I have is from 3322. I just yeah. wanted to know. I just want to make sure I'm understanding it. So if you, if you take 138 times um, 40,000. 40, no, not 40,000, 40. Perhaps who could uh, figure that out at another time, brother? Yeah, we don't have to do it right now. I just, I, I just want to make sure that I have uh, the latest document. We'll make sure you get that. Because I just saw the spreadsheet today from Kurt. Next one. Make sure that I have the right. So if you take the fifty-five, it turns into that turns into fifty-five twenty um, per year at a at. Plus the two fifty is three hundred five twenty. That's where that comes from. Okay. And those are the rates that those are the rates that Doug had provided us. Okay. So yes, the answer to your initial question is yes, they're Doug's rates. We okay. did discuss at our last meeting um, doing you know keeping the rate at one hundred forty instead of lowering it to one thirty eight. Um, the prior rate was one forty, and uh, 0 0.02 cents didn't really make or 0 0.02 cents per thousand gallons to us. It didn't make sense to lower the rate. So we, at our last meeting, discussed keeping it at 140. Okay, thank you. Insignificant difference. Okay, no further action on this or discussion on this. I'd like to um, move on to the review of the minutes of uh, the meeting of Tuesday, May 10th which Karen, I know, sent out to everyone. Mm -hmm. um, do I hear a motion to accept the meeting minutes? Actually, Jim, I, I do have one correction um, on those minutes. Um, there's, there's a term in there, uh, the term resident and residence in the motion. Um, that, that is kind of going back and forth. It's unclear whether it's a resident or a residence. Um, I did look up the difference between uh, resident, residence, I should say, and dwelling. And in terms of zoning and in terms of legal definition, um, the term that I think we want to have in that motion is the word dwelling. Because um, okay. that's what's used in zoning. Uh, and, and it'd be clearer both legally and I think it, it means what we want, which is um, a separate unit that's um, capable of being inhabited. And that's, that's sort of what the dwelling means. Um, the, the rate doesn't apply to a resident per, you know, like an individual. And, it, and a residence is not necessarily legally clear. So, so yeah. if I may read it then, Kurt, the motion would have been to accept unit method whereby each dwelling that is attached to a meter that we multiply the customer service fee slash charge by the number of dwellings and multiply the building block by the number of dwellings. That's correct. So that's, that's um, we probably need to re-vote re it because of that word change, but I think that's the right way to vote it. Okay. I'm not sure we can amend or I don't think through minutes we can change that word. I think we have to just, if you could reread the motion with the word dwelling in there and then we could revote it, I think we'll be fine. Um, okay. So yeah, let's, look, well, let's first uh, revote it then. So the motion would be to accept the unit method whereby each dwelling that is attached to a meter that we multiply the customer service fee slash charge by the number of dwellings and multiply the building block by the number of dwellings. Second. Okay. And um, we'll take a vote on it then. Katerine? 
Aye. Neil. Neil, you're you're muted, Neil. Aye. Tom. Aye. Um, Kurt. Aye. And I vote aye. So the vote is five to zero on, on, on the new motion. So I'm not sure, what do we do then with it? We'll strike this, the motion from the, uh, the minutes from the last meeting. Is that, I'm not sure, is that an acceptable strategy here, how to deal with that? I think that's what we, I think, so, I think that's what we discussed. Um, so I'm not sure we want to change the, the minutes. I think we just vote, you know, we vote to accept the minutes. Um, okay. And then this set of minutes, this is going to, it's going to um, override revise, it. it's going to revise the original motion. Okay. So are there any other comments uh, with respect to the minutes of the meeting of May 10th? Uh, are we saying, are we leaving the word residence where it is? It's just changing where we see residences. I think the word should have been re residence, not resident, D-E-N-T, but um, residence um, is what we were talking about at the last meeting, but it's inconsequential. So I think we can, you know, it doesn't really matter. We've changed the motion, so it's okay. Okay. So do I hear a, mo a motion to accept the meeting, the minutes of the meeting of May 10th? So moved. Second. Um, did someone second it? I did. Okay, thank you. So roll call vote. Um, Catherine. Aye. Neil. Aye. Tom. Aye. Kurt. Aye. And I vote aye. Okay, thank you. The meeting minutes are accepted. Um, so um, next meeting date. 24. Um, Let's see. Um, I'm not available on the 20. No, I am available on the 24th. Okay. Okay. So we can meet next week. Right. Is that going to be executive session or regular? It, it will be an executive session. Okay. Or we'll, we'll start. We'll start as a um, open meeting, and then we'll go into executive session. Okay. Do. So I have. Yeah, I think uh, we. I, I think we can talk, Jim. Just to be clear, I think we can talk about the um, uh, rainwater collection and the um, tanker movement of water in open session, but then just talk about the uh, the specific rate proposals and right, executive exactly. sessions. Right. Sure. Uh, um, yeah. All right. Um, any okay. So the meeting will be on the 24th. 24th. Yep. Um, do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. 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 Okay. Roll call vote, Katri. Aye. Neil. Aye. Tom. Aye. Kurt? Aye. And I vote aye as well. well thank you for participating. Um, thank you, Gail, for being part of the meeting again. Um, and uh, thank you, Karen. Yeah, no problem, Jim. All right. Jim, All right. thanks, Jim, folks. Call me. Oh. Call me tomorrow, Jim, and let's talk about what numbers you need for the executive session and which okay. on the billing. Okay. okay. Thank Got you. It. Thank you. Good night. Thank Good night. you, Tyler. Bye. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.